Well, good evening and welcome back for our service tonight. Let's join together in song.
Good evening, church family. This is Pastor McInerney, Bible Baptist Church, Savannah. Hope that you had a wonderful Lord's Day afternoon, and I'm looking forward to this evening's message. If you want to go ahead and find in your Bibles the book of Genesis, chapter 3, the first book of our Bible, Genesis chapter 3. While you're turning there, I want to just remind you of a couple things we mentioned this morning. I'm excited to uh, share that this Thursday, May the 7th, Thursday, May the 7th is the National Day of Prayer, and it's an annual event that our nation celebrates, and uh, it's been going on for five or six decades, uh, maybe longer. But uh, we are doing something different uh, to kind of launch into this new month of services. We are meeting here for a drive-in service, a drive-in National Day of Prayer service uh, at 7 p.m. this Thursday. We encourage you to, to come and uh, just park here in the parking lot. We'll have men directing you. We need to stay in our cars. The buildings won't be accessible, but we'll have a stage out front, and uh, you'll tune in to an FM station. We'll give you information when you pull into the lot. Uh, we've had this technology for a few weeks, but we have not tried it uh, in a service yet. And so we're going to use this as a launch into our drive-in services for the month of May, and so beginning next Sunday, May the 10th, at 5 p.m., we'll be offering a drive-in evening service for the Sunday nights of May. We'll still uh, live stream everything. We'll still have these videos for those who cannot come or do not want to try the drive-in feature, but uh, this is one step of us getting closer to back to normal as we start getting people back on the campus, albeit uh, through this method. Several churches have been doing it in our area for many, many weeks now. As I say, we've had the technology for over a month, but uh, just didn't feel the timing was right. And now as a gradual step to normalcy, we're going to do this on Sunday nights in May. It starts this Thursday with the National Day of Prayer and then each Sunday night afterward. And we will update you as, uh, as developments change or as we have more information. But in Genesis chapter number 3, a message tonight that God knows, but do you know? God knows, but do you know? And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. We find here the first question from God in the scriptures. And God asks this question, where are you? I once saw a pamphlet called Great Questions for, for God. Great Questions for God. And the author of the pamphlet was explaining different questions that people have for God. Like, why do you allow suffering in this world? Why did this happen to me? Why do we allow uh, God, why would you allow warfare and bloodshed and evil and even uh, these types of pestilence and disease? And so mankind, the pamphlet went on, mankind has a lot of questions for God. But have you ever stopped, friend, to consider that God has some questions for you and me? God has some questions for mankind, and the very first one is found in this book of Genesis. The first family, the first human beings, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, God says, where are you? Where are you? 
In Job 38, verse 3, God said this to the man Job, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. So God said, listen, Job, I'm going to put you on the, on the witness stand here. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to demand of you, and you're going to have to answer me. And so God has some questions for mankind. And his first question is there in verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? Notice God didn't ask him, How are you? How are you doing, Adam? How are you doing, Eve? And uh, we know that God called their name Adam, and so you got Mr. and Mrs. Adam. And uh, one of the traditions of us, of women taking the man's name, comes from this story right here, where God called them Adam. And uh, so the woman took the name of the man. But he didn't say, how are you doing? He says, where are you? Now, that is somewhat of a, of a strange question, because God knows everything, amen? God knows everything. See, I've been preaching so long to an empty auditorium, I'm asking you to amen, and you're not even here to amen me. So just, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and make me feel good. Amen right there in your living room when I say amen. Oh, you missed it. Do it again. Amen. There it is. So it's a strange question because God knows everything. God knew exactly where they were. I've preached about Adam and Eve before. You know, it's not like they could really hide in a crowd, right? They're the only ones there. They're the only ones in the garden. They're the only uh, human beings on the earth at the time. And so it's not as if they could slip away uh, and, and be lost in a crowd. But God says, where are you? And Christian, this is a Sunday night message, and most of you watching are, are uh, strong Christian folks, and you understand that God wasn't asking for his benefit. God asked that question for their benefit. Questions convict. Questions convict. Statements, many times, condemn. But questions bring conviction. When the highway patrolman says, do you know how fast you were going? Uh, that is a convicting statement. When a parent asks their child, uh, do you have your chores done? Or how did you do on that test? Uh, or did you clean your room? Those are all convicting questions. And so questions convict. And God asked the question not because he didn't know the answer, but because he wanted Adam to respond. He wanted Adam to identify where he was. God wanted Adam to realize his need. This is the first time in this relationship that they have hid from the Lord. This is the first time that they were guilty or felt conviction. And God wanted them to recognize, notice in verse 10, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. It's the first time fear. The first time man knew fear was because of sin. Because of sin. Sin brought fear. It brought guilt. It brought conviction. And God wanted Adam to know that something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong in the garden of Eden. I heard the songwriter say the birds had hushed their singing. In the garden there was silence. You could sense it for something had died. And that's exactly what God said would happen. In the day that you eat thereof you will surely die. Now we know that Adam and Eve did not die physically that day. They didn't just fall over and give up the ghost and, and, uh, and were done. No, no, no. But something did die that day. The spirit of man died, and it is that dead spirit that is the reason that we must be born again. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say you must be born again, because Adam and Eve died spiritually that day, and they passed that dead spirit as an inheritance to every human being that followed them. Sin brought guilt. It brought fear. I was afraid. He'd never been afraid of God before. He'd never been afraid 
to see God, to talk to God, to hear the voice of God. He'd never been afraid. But now sin has entered the picture. and Sin changes everything for Adam and Eve. God wanted them to know where they were spiritually, where they were in their relationship. And so I bring this evening message, God knows, but do you know? God knows, but do you know? So let me ask you a few questions as your friend, as your pastor. A few questions that may bring conviction. The first is this, where are you in your spiritual condition? Where are you in your spiritual condition? You know, we have many diverse groups of people, and we have all kinds of, of categories that we place people in. But spiritually, now I'm talking here about salvation, there's only two categories you can be in. You're either saved or you're lost. You can't be partially saved. You can't be almost saved because, friend, to be almost saved is to be totally lost. There's only two categories. There's no middle ground. You're either saved or you're lost. Do you know where you are? Do you know which one is you? The saved, the born again, the child of God, the heir of God and joint heir of Christ, those bound for heaven, those uh, looking forward to that mansion over the hilltop, as I sang about on Sunday. Do you know where you are in the roll call of heaven, in the, in the book of life? Do you know that your name is there? Do you have that settled? Did you settle the account long ago? Maybe you just were saved recently and you transferred from the list of lost to those who are saved. Notice with me First John 5. 13. You can know where you are. These things have I written unto you, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. K-N-O-W. Mark it down, highlight it, underline it. That ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you know, friend, where you are spiritually? When it comes to your salvation. Now there are other categories of our spiritual life that we can address. But this first one is about our salvation. Do you know? You see Adam and Eve died spiritually that day. And except for God's grace and the shedding of blood. They would have went to hell for all eternity. You can read the rest of that chapter. How God provided them animal skins to cover their sin. And to cover their uh, uh, shame. And there was animal blood that was sacrificed that day because without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no remission of sin. And so you have a beautiful picture here. They sewed themselves fig leaves. They, they put together some aprons, if you will, some type of covering, some type of smock or, or something that would cover uh, the, their nakedness. And uh, this is a picture of man's uh, uh, attempts Man's attempts at works, his attempts at, at self-righteousness, his attempts to cover up his sin. But God didn't accept that, friend. He didn't accept it in the Garden of Eden, and he doesn't accept it today. There had to be a sacrifice. And the Bible doesn't tell us which animal gave its life that day. I personally believe it was lambs, it was sheep as a picture of the Lamb of God, which would take away the sin of the world. But whatever it was, some creature gave its life that day as God clothed them in animal skins, proving that only the blood can wash away our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so where are you today? Saved or lost? Are you clothed 
in the righteousness of the Lamb of God or are you sowing together man's ideas of works and religion? Oh, I've got a message coming up soon on religion versus relationship. I hope you don't have a religion. I hope you have a relationship. There's a huge world of difference. But are you trying to sow together fig leaves? Are you trying to cover your sin with man's attempts at righteousness? God will never accept it, friend. If you're not saved today and God says, where are you? Where are you? If, if in the next five minutes you should enter into eternity, where would you be? And that's a convicting question if you're not saved. And I encourage you, if you're lost, admit your need. Don't hide behind the fig leaf of religion or morals or good works or pride, but let the blood of Jesus speak for you. Where are you in your spiritual condition, saved or lost? Number two, and this would be directed more towards God's people, Christians, those who say, I'm saved, preacher, I've, I've accepted Christ, I've been born again. The second question, where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your walk with God? Notice back in our text, verse 8, please. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. What a sad commentary. What a sad commentary. Evidently, this had been a regular occurrence that God met with them in the garden. And he was looking forward to that fellowship. Remember, one of the reasons that he made human beings in the first place was for, uh, for someone to fellowship with him and to worship him and to honor him and to love him. And now they're hiding from him. What a, what a difference that sin makes. They went from a happy relationship with the Lord, a, a happy time of fellowship with the Lord, to now they are hiding. And I ask you, where are you in your walk with God? Are you happily going along your way, hand in hand with Jesus, as the song says? Just a closer walk with thee, grant it, Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Is that your song? Or are you in hiding? Are you a wall? I heard a story of a preacher one time greeting folks at the back door, and I can't wait till we get to do that. If we have to wave, if we have to elbow bump, if we have to, you know, just do whatever we got to do, I can't wait to see you all personally once again. But he saw a man that he hadn't seen in many, many years in church. And he said, Brother, you need to join the service of the Lord. He said, I'm in the service of the Lord, preacher. He said, well, how come I don't see you very often? He said, I'm undercover. I'm in the secret service. Hey, are you in the secret service of the Lord? Are, are, are you hard to find? Uh, does the preacher have to get a search warrant to find you? No, don't let it be said of you, friend, that you're hiding from God. Don't let it be said of you that you're hiding from the church. I remember visiting a fellow many times. He was the cleanest man in Clinton County, Ohio, because every time I knocked on his door, his wife or his child told me, he's in the shower. Preacher, he's in the shower. Preacher, he's in the shower. Didn't matter what time of day, what time of night, uh, what day of the week it was, he was always in the shower. He, he was hiding out from the preacher. Hiding out from the preacher. Are you hiding from God? Are you hiding do you look forward to fellowship with him, or are you like Adam and Eve and have this fear of his presence? Are you looking forward to time spent with God? Would you say that your walk with God is close, or that your walk with God is casual? Is your walk with God close, or is your walk with God casual? I saw a sign one time that said, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, who moved? If you're not as close to God as you used to be, who moved? And obviously the answer is convicting, isn't it? This question is convicting because God doesn't change. I am the Lord, I change not. 
And so you who once burned with fervency about the things of God, you who couldn't wait uh, for church to start, you who couldn't wait to read your Bibles and pray, are you now uh, finding yourself hiding from God or, or distant from God or, or the fire has burned out, so to speak, in your spiritual fervency? And if that is the case, who moved? Did God change? Did His Word become less important? Did His fellowship become less exciting and joyful and peaceful? If you're not as close as you once were, the question is, who moved? Who moved? Are you seeking the Lord or are you stagnant? in your spiritual walk? Are you growing in your walk with Christ or have you stopped? These are questions that convict. And I say again, God knows the answer. But do you know the answer? God knows the answer, but do you know where you are in your walk with God? Some are trying to walk without God. They've charted their own path marking their own course, and they'll find themselves in a world of hurt when you try to walk through this world without the steady hand, the protective hand, and direction of God. Where are you? God knows, but do you know? Number three, where are you in your honesty with God? Look over to Malachi chapter 3, the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. Excuse me. The last book of the Old Testament in our Bible. Malachi. Now, don't get nervous because most of the time when a Baptist preacher mentions the book of Malachi, Baptists reach for their wallets and hold on tight. And I just want to share something with you tonight. This is not a message about stewardship. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk to you about money. Uh, and I want to actually take a moment to praise the Lord because uh, through all of this, last six, seven, eight weeks, our church has done a phenomenal job uh, of giving and uh, we're getting closer on our fill the well goal. Uh, we have actually seen some increases in some areas. Our online uh, participants of giving has uh, almost doubled some weeks and so I want to commend you. I'm not going to Malachi chapter 3 uh, to pound you about stewardship or about giving or about tithes and offerings. What I want you to see here is that these people didn't even realize where they were. That's the point of this lesson tonight. Do you know where you are? And in Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, God asks a question. Again, questions convict. Statements condemn. Questions convict. He asks the question, will a man rob God? Stop. What a question. Will a man rob God? He asked the question. And it's a good question. When you consider all of the blessings of God on your life, when you consider all of the gifts that He has given, and I, I'm not talking in, in some uh, uh, spiritual sense. I'm talking about tangible, hands-on, identifiable gifts, the food in your cupboards, the car in your driveway, the house over your head, the children that give you hugs and, and uh, uh, spend time with you, the, 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 the work ethic that you have, the ability to work, the mind, the back, the strength, the wisdom. When you think of all of the treasures that He has given to you and to me, how utterly, how utterly, utterly sinful of us to rob God, to rob God. So he asked the question, will a man rob God? But you have robbed me, he said, back in verse 8. But here's where I want you to see. But ye say, or the people said, wherein have we robbed thee? And then God answers the question for them in tithes and offerings. My point of this point number three is that they didn't even realize where they were. They didn't even realize that they were robbing God. 
And so I want you to consider the blessings of God in your life. And these people of, of Israel, this house of Israel, it, it wasn't just that they were robbing God. It was that they were robbing God and didn't even realize it. They didn't even recognize it. If God had wanted posters for robbery, would your face be on there? Would you be guilty, friend? Think about it in our stewardship and our tithes and offerings. He asked him very clearly, will a man rob God? But I just want you to get that understanding. They were so far out of order that they didn't even realize they were out of order. This is how I think about our country sometimes, especially recent weeks and months. We are so far gone in so many ways, we don't even realize how far gone we are. When we're giving away our liberties, when we're caving into political correctness, when we're, when we're spending trillions and trillions of dollars with no end in sight, we're so far gone. And you would ask the question to our leaders, well, what about this or what about that? And they haven't even, they don't even realize where we are. They don't even realize the danger we are. They don't even realize how far we've come from what America is supposed to be. And that's a scary thought. and That's a message for another time. Don't get me started. That's another message for another Sunday. But where are you in your honesty with God? It's a good question. It has to be asked. And then number four, where are you in the will of God? Where are you in the will of God? Notice the man Elijah, the great prophet of Israel. Back in 1 Kings chapter 19, you know the story well. I've preached it a few, a few times, maybe three or four times since I've been the pastor here. I've preached about this man Elijah in, in this contest with the prophets of Baal and different aspects of the story that we've talked about over the, uh, those messages. But I want you just to understand this part. He has had a great victory of God Fire has come down from heaven. The prophets of Baal have been destroyed. And now Jezebel is threatening his life and he's running for his life. I think we just talked about this recently um, in one of our devotions, uh, devotionals, or it will be, uh, I think we did, just did it last week. But notice this, 1 Kings 19, verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? There's the question. So we're looking at questions. Where art thou? Where art thou? Where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your spiritual relationship? Where are you in your honesty with God? And now he says, where are you? Where are you in the will of God? Look at verse 13 of the same chapter, 1 Kings 9, 13. And he said, I, I think we've missed this verse. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a repetition. It's a repetition. He says it again. Where, what doest thou here, Elijah? What doest thou here, Elijah? Go back to verse number 9, please. 1 Kings 19 and verse 9. Notice the voice. What doest thou here, Elijah? And that's the emphasis that I was looking for. So where are you in the will of God? Because if you know the rest of the story, God had much more for Elijah to do. But here he is, hiding out, feeling sorry for himself. He'd actually asked God to take his life. And he's hiding out. God has provided for him with food and water, but he asked the question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I think, uh, again, a Sunday night uh, uh, congregation can handle this question, but you and I are here to fill, fulfill the will of God in our lives. God has a specific will for every one of us. And so where are you in the will of God? He said, what are you doing here? Because there's somewhere else I need you to be. There's another plan I have. And if you read the rest of that chapter, you'll see that he wanted him to anoint another king. He wanted him to find Elisha to take over. He wanted him to, to instruct the prophets that had not bowed their knee to Baal. Uh, he had a lot for Elijah to do, but Elijah was stuck in his progress. And so sometimes I think the Holy Spirit of God says to you and me, what are you doing here? In other words, okay, you've been saved a long time. Why are you still in your spiritual infancy? You've been planning to do this for a long time spiritually. Why haven't you done it yet? Maybe it was to read the Bible this year. Guess what? Uh, we're into May already. Have you started? Have you cracked the book? Have you, have you begun? 
Maybe God had called you to serve in a, in a ministry in the local church. Now, I know we've not been able to meet, but are you preparing yourself for that? Are you reaching out and, and uh, for discipleship, or are you studying? Are you ready to go so that when these doors are open wide again and we can welcome the congregation back, that you are ready to step up? Uh, maybe God has called you to a ministry. Maybe God has called you to give uh, more to missions. Uh, are you, what are you doing here? In other words, uh, the old saying is you can't get there standing here. You can't get there standing here. What steps are you taking to fulfill God's will for your life. That's the point of number four. What are you doing here, Elijah? Not what are you doing, but what are you doing here? And so in your spiritual life, in your journey, in God's call on your life, in His plan for your life, are you making progress? Are you going forward? Are you advancing uh, in the program, in the process that the Lord has for you? To the best of your knowledge, are you where you need to be spiritually in your growth plan, in your service plan, in giving, in living for Jesus? Are you where you need to be? And then quickly, number five, go to the New Testament book of Luke. The New Testament book of Luke chapter 9. And here we're going to see a question, where are you in your spirit toward others? Where are you in your spirit toward others? In Luke 9, verse 51, uh, a neat story. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, verse 52, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, and as the story goes, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, now they're called the sons of thunder, because of their zeal, their aggressiveness. But when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did or Elijah? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So very quickly, what happened is Jesus is passing through this village, and, and uh, th they, they recognize that he's not staying. He's intent to go to Jerusalem, and so they're not very welcoming. They're not very hospitable, and in that culture, that was seen as an insult. And so James and John uh, take opportunity here uh, to, to want to uh, bring down judgment. Lord, these people have insulted you. They have offended you. They're not receiving you as they should, as the shepherd of Israel. They're not re receiving you. And, and should, Lord, could, could we just call down some fire? Can we just uh, go ahead and wipe this people out uh, like Elijah did? And uh, certainly they were looking for the power of that miracle in their own lives. But here's the point. They didn't know. Jesus said, you know not what spirit you're of. You know not what spirit year of, kind of like those people who didn't know they were robbing God. He says, you don't know where you're, what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Listen, he said, I didn't come to destroy these people. I came to save these people. I, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save men's lives. And here you are, my apostles, my disciples, my leaders, and you're off message. You're off target. The message is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, not Jesus Christ, the destroyer of men's lives. And so even as God's people, this is why I caution you, even as God's people, sometimes we have such a zeal, but we don't have understanding. We have an aggressiveness, but we don't know what we're do talking about. And this is exactly what happened to James and John. And if it could happen to James and John, friend, it certainly could happen to you and me. Think about this. They saw those people as a burden. They saw those people as an insult. But God saw them as people in need of a Savior. How do you see people? How do you see the people at your work? And I know if you work around lost people, it can be very frustrating. It can be frustrating working around saved people. But if you work around lost people, it can be very frustrating. It can be very depressing. 
and very discouraging. But friend, I want to remind you that Jesus came to save those people. And so don't look at them as uh, burdens, but look at them as blessings. Don't look at them as obstacles, but look at them as opportunities to share the love of Christ, to share the love of the Lord, to share the gospel. And I know that you can get some pushback and you can have some persecution from that. And you can certainly have some insult and some offense from trying to reach certain people. But don't let that stop you. Because Jesus didn't come to destroy those people. He came to save those people. Are people a burden to you or a blessing? What about it? Where are you in your spirit towards others, even Christian people? Is there something undone in your relationship with others? Is there some forgiveness that needs to be granted on your part? In other words, someone has come to you for forgiveness and you have not done it yet? Where are you? Maybe you need to seek forgiveness from someone and you haven't done that yet. Something's undone. What about a resolution to a conflict? What about long-suffering? What about extending grace to people that you may not agree with? Where are you in your spirit toward other people? What about in your home, in your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, your relationship with other Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ? Where are you? in your relationship or your spirit toward other people? It's a good question. Questions convict. Where are you? And then lastly, where are you in your influence of others? This is a truth that crosses all boundaries. But in life, we are either a positive influence towards people or we are a negative influence toward people. Kind of like a battery has a positive and a negative, you know? Well, you and I are the same way. We have a positive, we have a negative. Think about this. What about your influence? Are you having a more positive influence for the things of God or a negative influence for the things of God? Are others being saved because of you? Are others being saved because of you? You know, I've been watching with some, uh, I just guess I'm, lost for words here, so, amazement is a good word, I guess, at some of the things that people are doing with their money during this pandemic. Uh, I, I noticed that in Pennsylvania, I think it was, it could have been New Jersey, but one of those states, when liquor stores were allowed to open again, in one day, in one day in a major city, a metropolitan area, over $2 million was spent on liquor purchases in one day. And I think about what, what, what if that $2 million had gone, uh, you know, to, to whatever. In one day, $2 million, $2.3 million on liquor. What if that, and that certainly wasn't going to be a positive influence, I can tell you that right now. The outcome of that $2 million in liquor was not a good thing. It could have gone to a children's hospital. It could have gone to first responders, uh, equipment. It could have gone to missions. It could have gone to homeless shelters and soup kitchens. They could do a lot with $2 million. But no, it it got guzzled in alcohol. We have a positive influence. We have a negative influence. Are we doing more for the cause of Christ? Or are we doing things to hurt the cause of Christ? Are others being saved because of you? Are others growing in Christ because of you? Is your family being blessed because of you? of you. Uh, This, dads especially, you got to listen to this. The life of Solomon, if you study the king, kings of Israel, the life of Solomon, and Solomon wasn't perfect. He was a good king. and He was a godly king. He had some problems later in his life because his wives, there's a problem right there. When you have have to use the multiple of wife, his wives, the Bible says, turned his heart away from God. When that happened, he had some problems in the end of his, of his reign. But listen, by and large, the Bible says that Solomon was blessed his whole life, not just because of him, but because of his father, David. Over and over again, the Bible talks about for David's sake, for David's sake, 
for David's sake. Solomon got blessed for David's sake. I wonder if one day my kids will be able to look back and say, you know what, my life was blessed not just because of my walk with God, but because of my dad and my mom and their walk with God. It's a good question, isn't it? It's a convicting question. Are we having a positive influence in our family? Are we having a negative influence? Are we bringing reproach to the name of Christ? Are people, uh, by and large, being turned away from God because of our negative influence? What about it? Oh, I could go on and on with a list of questions, but let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up tonight. God knows where you are in all of these instances and so many more, but He wants us to know. He didn't ask Adam, how are you doing? He wanted Adam to answer, where are you at? And sometimes, I just put this together, sometimes the how we are doing is because of where we are at. Does that make sense? If we were in a, if we were in a better place, We'd be doing better. Man, that'll preach. Somebody ought to say Shazam. If we were in a better place, we'd be doing better. And so let these questions tonight convict and bring the answer to the Lord. Respond to Him. Admit your need if there's one or more of these categories that need some work. You can hide from everyone but God. And one of the things that being away from the congregation, being away from the assembled uh, gathering of God's people is being out of Sunday school, being out of church, is we can, we can get comfortable in that lack of accountability, that lack of, of, um, of being where we're supposed to be. Don't let that happen. Answer the questions to the Holy Spirit You can try to cover up with fig leaves like Adam and Eve, but God still knew where they were. And so tonight, I encourage you, ask the questions, get the answers, and if you don't like the answer, do something about it. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Would you pray with me in closing this evening's service? Tonight's service has been primarily for God's people, for saved people But we did talk about the lost in the beginning of the message. And I just want to uh, close out this message by throwing out the invitation. Uh, This old song says, throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. And friends, you may be sinking. You may be drifting And if you're not saved, if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, I want to throw out that lifeline and tell you that God loves you, that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sin as the Son of God, the sinless Lamb of God. He came to die for you and for me. And He gave His life on the cross. He shed His blood willingly so that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so this evening, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, I invite you to pray with me. From a sincere heart, would you offer this prayer? Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose from the grave. And tonight, I call upon you to forgive me of my sin, to save my soul. And I call upon you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And all of God's people said amen. Amen. Christian, I hope this has been a help to you. And if you have listened tonight and you have prayed to accept Christ as your Savior, I encourage you, contact the church. Let us know by email or through our 
uh, website or through Facebook comments or some way on YouTube. That let us know that you have made this decision that we might rejoice with you. And Christian, when you hear the question, where are you? Remember, God asks questions. It's okay to ask God some questions, but don't forget God has the right to ask you some questions too. I pray that you'll have a great week. I'm going to put out a pastor's page tomorrow with a few more details about our drive-in services coming soon. Also, we'll have our Tuesday and Thursday devotionals, our piano with the preacher in the book of Romans on Wednesday, and the National Day of Prayer this Thursday night, 7 o'clock, drive-in service, and we'll share more information through the email and the website and Facebook. God bless you. Have a great evening, and we'll see you again soon.